Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's public safety briefing led by Deputy Mayor for Public Safety, Phil Banks. Following our last speaker, we will take a few questions from the media, followed by some questions that have been submitted by the public ahead of today's briefing. I would now like to turn it over to Deputy Mayor Phil Banks. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Uh, I would like to wish everyone um, and those who are observing Ramadan, Ramadan started yesterday, Ramadan Mubarak, and certainly a peaceful and blessed Ramadan period for all. Okay, so I'm here today joined by four of my colleagues. Um, and once again, this is our process of informing the public of the steps that we are taking to keep you safe. As I said, during the first time we started this, and you will hear continuously, this is a two-way street. Some would argue it's a three-way street. We're going to be informing you, but just as important, we need you to inform us of what are you seeing out there, what are you hearing, and what are your ideas and suggestions that we can continue to keep New York City safe as the safest big city in America. You're going to be joined by four people today. One of them you've heard from before. He's Chief Mike LePetri. He's the Chief of Crime Control Strategies for the NYPD. And he's going to be speaking about two topics. One topic is going to be about these illegal weed shops and the proliferation of them and the damages that they're causing throughout the city. And he's also going to be talking about auto and auto-related thefts. Then you're going to hear from the Parks Department. I'm joined today by the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer, Mark Folk. And he is accompanied by Assistant Commissioner Edwin Rodriguez. And they're going to be talking very excitingly about a new initiative uh, that they are going to be utilizing as far as keeping the parks safe. Cleanliness of the parks go hand in hand with, with public safety. And um, it's actually very exciting to see that they're looking at this initiative. And I think that the uh, citizens are going to be very happy about what we're doing to keep our parks, continue to keep them clean. And last but not least, we're going to be here from Deanna Logan, who is the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. She is going to briefly explain to you exactly what that office does, but then she's going to have a presentation and she's going to discuss recidivism and what exactly that means and the impact that it is having on our, our city. And there's a small number of individuals that's committing an inordinate amount of crime and impacting the city. And it's a very interesting, very informative uh, a presentation, Deanna, and I know that everybody's going to get a lot, a lot out of that. So for those of you who are tuning in, thank you. I appreciate it. We're going to have these discussions. You're going to see them expand. You're going to see a lot more people from city and city government. In the future, you're going to see people from our external partners that we work with come up here. And this discussion and this informative session, uh, we believe is going to be very beneficial. So we'd like for you to uh, share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, share it with anyone who you think would benefit, share it with everybody. Go to hearfromeric.com. You can sign up. You sign up on the link. You will get a link. We will inform you about the topics that we will be discussing. It will be a platform for you to submit your questions so that we can answer your questions. And then you can, it's the start for you to engage in these conversations with us. So once again, thank you for all who is joining. Our first topic today that we're going to be speaking about is this increase of these illegal weed shops, right? Um, smoke shops that you're seeing that's taking place all throughout the city. Um, and if you have not seen them, I just ask you to open up your eyes because every day it seems like there are more and more that are opening up. And uh, I just want to take a minute, or just a brief second to really explain what we're faced with here before Mike LePetri goes into the details. New York City and New York State, like many other states, have looked, upon, looked historically at the enforcement of marijuana for decades and come to the conclusion that there was unjust enforcement. It was over-enforcement in this area. And it was a lot of people in a lot of communities that were severely impacted by the marijuana, the marijuana laws. And New York State said, we're going to do something about this. We're going to legalize cannabis, and we're going to allow and have a system in place that communities and people who were unjustly uh, and unfairly targeted by the criminal justice system who got swept up into that, into that net, that they will be given an opportunity, right, uh, to be able to prosper from the legal cannibalization in New York. But there's a group of people out there who says, no, uh-uh, stop. We're not going for that. We're not going to wait in line. We're not going to flood the application. We're not going to have our marijuana regulated. And we're also going to sell it to your kids, and we're going to target it to your kids, and we're going to disguise it as candy. 
and we're going to disguise it as breakfast cereals. So let's think about this. We as a government have decided to say, hey, we're going to correct the wrong, and then we're going to now look to positively impact uh, certain communities, and we're going to legalize cannabis. Other people have said no. They're not going to be able to do that. And I am, and I think you're going to hear that I believe Albany has, is listening. And I think Albany has heard. I'd like to thank the governor and all the people in Albany who are at least taking this and making this the level of importance so that we can strengthen our laws to be able to impact the individuals who decided that they are not going to play by the rules. And I think this is something that as a, as a city and as a state, we need to keep that high level of uh, importance and priority. And quite frankly, I think we need to drive them out of business. It is going to, and it has already impacted our communities, as you will hear shortly, mm -hmm. about the violence that's associated with it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Chief LaPetri, can you start telling us about these illegal uh, shops that we're seeing, these smoke shops, and what we can be doing about them? Yes, sir. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So as, as the Deputy Mayor stated, we, we've seen a sharp increase in both the ownership and the selling of illegal cannabis inside of smoke shops. We've identified almost 1,700 smoke shops in New York City, and they pop up daily. So what we've been looking at is, are these smoke shops acting illegally? Are there complaints associated to those smoke shops, whether it be 311 or 911 complaints? How many feet is the smoke shop from the nearest school. And with the illegal sale of cannabis in some of these stores comes a cash business that individuals are targeting. We've seen over 100 smoke shop related robberies already this year. And what we're also seeing is the use of multiple motor vehicles that are either stolen or have paper plates being used to then commit these, uh, these robberies. So what's the NYPD doing? We have really stepped up our enforcement with our partners in, in other city agencies. But we've also have robbery task force in most of our boroughs, both on the patrol and the detective side of, of the investigations. And we've, you know, we, we've made hundreds of arrests just this year, and we're gonna to continue to, uh, to focus on not, not only the illegal sale of marijuana, but also make sure that, that these stores are, are safe and so are the surrounding areas. One thing that the uh, deputy mayor and myself ha have been speaking about and the police commissioner is an increase in catalytic converter thefts in New York City. Over the past two plus years, over 13,000 catalytic converters have been stolen in New York City. And when I speak to other law enforcement professionals around the tri-state area, they're also seeing the same problem. So why? Well, it really started in 2021 where we saw sharp increases in these thefts. And it's a low risk, high reward kind of crime, but it also affects families. Think about going outside and thinking you're going to, to school or to a game or to the store, and now you can't use your car and it takes a while for it to get fixed. So the city passed two bills last year that is helping with the enforcement and also the state is, uh, has just passed a bill in regards to catalytic converters. So I'd like to speak about a specific program that the NYPD had started in the summer of 2021. It's called the NYPD CAT scan program. So what this does is we etch a unique serial number onto the catalytic converter, and then we enroll that into a database. That serial number allows the NYPD to identify the vehicle that the catalytic converter belongs to. And then what we can do is, all we have to do is scan a QR code with the NYPD issued phone and check it through that database. We've had four of these events where we have done etching and we have two events ten tentatively scheduled for April in Staten Island and Queens. And we also 
put a vehicle catalytic converter NYPD CAT scan program sticker on the vehicle, identifying the thieves that that car is in the system of the NYPD's CAT scan program. So I want to go back to something, Mike, uh, and, and so we, it's interesting, right? So we have the uh, people stealing cars. Oftentimes, when they are, are stealing your catalytic converter, they're stealing them out of illegal cars. They're stealing a car, and then they're going to steal your catalytic converter. But let's just go back a second to the, the illegal smoke shops. I want to be clear. We're talking about the illegal smoke shops, uh, not the ones who are operating uh, and conforming with the laws. <clears throat> Um, I understand that robberies are up in these establishments significantly. Is that accurate? That is correct. So, so we've really seen a, an, an uptick in, in these types of robberies in New York City last year, and it continues into this year. And you have approximately what percentage of that in, 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 uh, uptick is? And these, what, these armed robberies, people going in with guns yes. to rob the location? Yes. Um, most of them are... Uh, with gunpoint robberies, multiple perpetrators will enter. And what we see is they then go on to commit another one in another borough, go commit another one in another borough. So we've had upwards of, of groups of individuals do 20 to 25 <coughs> smoke shop robberies in a month. And they're targeting the, the cash that's on site. Now, why, why are these businesses having so much cash on site? Well, it's it's to circumvent the, the tax law, and I think that uh, the mayor's uh, proposed new bill to increase civil and tax penalties for unlicensed unlicensed and illicit sale of cannabis w will be something that that will help. You know that if uh, cannabis has been legalized and decriminalized on the state level. Uh, the federal laws uh, have, have not quite caught up with that. If you uh, uh, deposit money into a federal bank uh, and it was proceeds of, of uh, cannabis, are you a, uh, committing a federal violation? These businesses are not going to play with the feds, right, because the penalties are too harsh. So they're not putting this money into the bank. And then it makes it an attraction for that cash to be on hand and then for the bad guys and the bad girls with the guns to go into rob, right? So... They're not going to try not to break the Fed law because the penalties are severe and adequate and, and sufficient, but they are willing to break the state and city laws. So I just want to actually applaud our partners in Albany because I do believe they are looking at this and I believe that they're considering um, increasing the potential sanctions that we can impose when we uncover these illegal smoke shops who are targeting our, our individuals there. So thank you, Albany, for actually taking a look at this and certainly uh, for city, for the residents for, for bringing this out to us and for city government for raising this particular issue. But it is, uh, it is a very, very important issue. So, so thank you, uh, Chief LaPetri. Thank you, Deputy Mike. So next we're going to uh, speak to our partners in the Parks Department, and they're going to inform us about a new initiative that... Uh, mm -hmm. Is, uh, I'm actually excited about because I do believe cleanliness is next to godliness, and it's certainly it is a hand in hand related to public safety, which is a very important. So, so uh, Commissioner, great. Tell me what we're going to hear. Well, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Banks. We greatly appreciate the invitation, and we also do agree that cleanliness goes hand in hand with public safety. Yes. Um, last week we marked the arrival of spring, which is really the beginning of the ramp up of the busiest time at parks. Just for a bit of context, we at New York City Parks are responsible for 30,000 acres of land in the city, which is almost 14% of the city of New York. We have over 1,000 playgrounds, 800 athletic fields. It's a very large system. As the weather warms up, so does our operation. We've been grooming ball fields, and we shortly will begin to turn on over 3,400 drinking fountains, 800 spray features, which are really critical to help keep New Yorkers cool and hydrated as the temperatures warm up. We're also preparing to open all of our beaches and over 50 of our outdoor pools, again, critical to help New Yorkers cool down and enjoy the summer. But as the deputy mayor noted, safety and cleanliness and programming go hand in hand. It's our mission at Parks to make sure that everyone is welcome and safe when they visit any one of our 1,700 parks. 
We believe one of the best strategies to do this is to have well-maintained parks. Our maintenance is a key to that. To that end, we're so pleased that Mayor Adams included in his Get Stuff Clean campaign for the first time ever a dedicated second shift cleaning initiative at a select number of parks across the five boroughs. These 240 newly hired parkies will be working afternoon and evening hours from Thursday through Monday, so over the weekend, cleaning what we at parks called hot spots which is our heavily used sites during the warmer weather months. So think of picnic areas, barbecue sites, places where families and patrons gather. We're dedicating staff to make sure that they're clean so when you show up to use a park, it's clean. And along with cleanliness comes safety. Simply put, we're committed to maintaining our parks over a broader period of time at a larger number of parks across all five boroughs. Critical to that also is the staff maintaining our over 1,400 public restrooms. There's been a lot of conversations in the press and amongst uh, our colleagues in government and the public about the importance of the public having access to safe and clean restrooms. We are very pleased at Parks that we provide more public restrooms than any other agency in the city, and 1,400 of them open <coughs> seven days a week throughout the year. We do really like to remind New Yorkers, though, that clean and safe parks is also dependent upon your use and your coming to parks. So if you see issues, you see concerns, please call either 911 or 311 to report cleanliness issues. And if you're coming to barbecue, we really do appreciate if you clean up after yourselves, pick up after yourselves, bag up the trash, and then place it right next to one of our trash containers, and we'll make sure it gets out of there very quickly and or if you want to carry it out, carry in, carry out, we also appreciate that. So again, on behalf of all our hardworking colleagues at Parks, we appreciate this opportunity, Deputy Mayor, and we look forward to a great summer. I appreciate you. So, so, so let's, let's go over a couple of potential takeaways. One is that if you are visiting the Parks and if you see something, whether it's cleanliness related or not, that does not look appropriate, uh, we'd like for you to call 311 or, of course, if it's an emergency, call 911, right? That's the first takeaway, correct? Correct, absolutely. Either 311 or 911. Yeah. And the second takeaway is that if you're utilizing the park, do the best you can, right, to clean up after yourself, right? Put your garbage in the garbage cans or I think take it with you or however you're going to see. But you can help us uh, by helping yourself, right? You can, you can, how's it go? You can help us help you. Correct. By you actually doing a lot of cleaning up yourself. But we're also dedicating resources where they were not dedicated before, right? Dedicated shifts to mm -hmm. evening and weekend hours. Correct. So would this be a correct statement that the areas at least where we're starting this initiative, and I think you said it was you know 62 different facilities that the people should see cleaner this year than they did previously? Absolutely. That's our goal. Yes. Okay. Yep. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so last but certainly not least, right? I am joined here by Deanna Logan. Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Me and Deanna speak uh, five or six times a day. Uh, she has a very, very critical and important uh, job. And I think it's going to be interesting what she is going to be speaking about now. So, so Deanna, if we could just get a real quick overview, because a lot of people may not truly know or understand what the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice does. And then you're going to have a presentation that's going to focus in on recidivism and just certain areas in the criminal justice system, right? Yes. Okay, it's on you. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with my colleagues from the Parks Department, from New York City Police Department. They keep me with Chief LePetri all the time, apparently, but uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Banks. My name is Deanna Logan, and I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We affectionately refer to ourselves as Mock J, Mock J and a lot of people refer to us as Mock J as well. We serve as the think tank and coordinating entity for the city's criminal justice system. And what does that mean? It means that we advise Mayor Adams and uh, Deputy Mayor Banks on criminal justice policy and serve as the mayor's representatives to the courts, to district attorneys, defender organizations, state criminal justice agencies, among other entities. We work with our law enforcement partners, with city agencies, not-for-profits, foundations, the public, 
And our goal is to implement data-driven anti-crime strategies and promote the operation of a fair justice system. Our efforts include projects to address current crime conditions, prevent offending, and build strong neighborhoods that ensure enduring safety. MockJ's work is grounded in data. We have our research innovation and policy teams. They work collaboratively to identify concerns that may be barriers to public safety. And so now, Deputy Mayor, I'm gonna just kind of go into some of the collaboration and the efforts that we've had on the one of the main, main crime challenges that we've been seeing, right? So under Mayor Adams' leadership with Deputy Mayor Banks, the city's public safety agencies began an unprecedented collaboration to align crime data across the city systems. MACJ, New York Police Department, Department of Correction, and many providers of our service work together to coordinate the data systems and produce an accurate picture of public safety landscape within the criminal justice framework of New York City. We also, MACJ, have a longstanding relationship with the Office of Court Administration's data team that both drives the data that's available and helps to analyze criminal justice trends. So with our sister city agencies and state city agencies, we also work with the partner service providers and justice involved individuals to obtain and review not only the quantitative data that you hear us talk about in terms of numbers, but qualitative data, like how it actually works for them on the ground to inform the city's government's critical criminal justice work. Our unprecedented collaboration across all of these multiple data streams allowed us to drill down into the city's most challenging public safety matters. That one challenge that New York City is facing right now is the recidivism problem. And when we talk about the recidivism problem, what we are really talking about is the deep dive into the data that shows us that approximately 9,000 people that have a recent persistent pattern of recurring criminal charges and missing court. And so I, I wanna be really clear about that because when we're talking about a recent persistent criminal charge pattern, we're, we're not saying that everybody's been convicted. We're saying that these individuals in a very short, quick period have been coming back on recurring criminal charges and they're failing to actually show up in court for those charges, right? So in the last year, 2022, there were approximately 190,000 arrests. And Chief LePetri will let you know, because you see he's smiling at me because he knows that that's accurate. Of those 9,000 individuals that were charged in court that had that pattern of recent persistent recurring criminal charges, the population of 9,000 represents 8% of all arrests, right? 8%. And then when we looked even closer, what we realized is those 9,000 with that pattern, of them, there are approximately 2,000 that would go on to commit violent felony offenses, right? 9,000 that have the recurring, and within that population, there's a pocket, small pocket of 2,000 individuals that go on to commit violent felony offenses. Now, putting that information into perspective, what we know is people with recent persistent pattern of recurring criminal charges and missing court are at high risk for failing to appear in court and committing another crime. However, they're also the small concentration of people who commit those crimes, right? We identified this group by working with all of our partners across agencies, service providers, and we worked together and we said, what do all of these people have in common? What do they share? And when we look at data, I can tell you that the research innovation team, they're, they're usually really complicated. And the, the thing that was most astonishing about this group of people is that what they shared was absolutely common sense. It wasn't complicated. It was that within this group, they were recent pending felony cases in court, multiple warrants, two or more in the past five years, several open cases, 
and three or more, right? Several open cases means three or more within the past five years. Once we actually honed in on those shared factors, it wasn't hard for all of the experts in the area to replicate our findings, right? That's when we know that we're, we're onto something, when we can give our partners the information of what we're seeing and they can take the data and they can do it themselves. And they did. And they concurred that these individuals were most likely to reoffend and miss court the same way that we came to that understanding. Now, what we also know is true from our data is that people within this, within the arrest population who don't have these shared factors and don't exhibit the pattern of recurring criminal charges and missing court are actually returning to court. So people who don't have warrants in the last five years, no convictions in the last three years, no felony convictions in the last 10 years, and no pending cases generally have significant fewer incidents of recurring criminal charges. So the data is clear. It shows that people who have recent patterns of recurring criminal charges are driving a considerable amount of the crime we're seeing today, right? This population of individuals, as you should be seeing on your screen, I hope you're seeing on your screen, disproportionately accounts for a significant percentage of the crime and non-court compliance. 8% of the arrested people, as you're seeing, out of the 190,000 citywide arrests in 2022, that group accounted for 27% of felony arrests. 22 of all or 22 percent of all arrests 29 percent of felony robbery arrests 57 percent of felony burglary arrests 36 percent of grand larceny arrests 33 percent of larceny auto arrests which i'm thinking chief lepetri falls into your catalytic converter population and then 60 percent of misdemeanor pettit larceny arrests The small population of individuals with this recent persistent pattern are actually really struggling. We know that. They are struggling to modify their own behavior. They're also individuals that are not susceptible to the supports that work for the majority of people that we talked about that aren't seeing that pattern. We understand that for some individuals with this recent persistent pattern of recurring criminal charges, a period of incarceration is warranted and in some cases, the necessary mechanism to order to disrupt that cycle. But we also understand that true public safety requires multiple methods and partners that can deploy the tactics to combine strong accountability and robust prevention strategies. We know that many among the recidivist group are struggling with a heightened level of need, and it means that in specific cases, we must employ a much more targeted form of support and supervision to provide intense services, accountability, coping skills that will afford these individuals the ability to overcome their behavior. Based on research in New York and other jurisdictions, we can improve outcomes for many of this group with a much more precise response to address their behavior and needs that would include more active and stringent supervision while they are out of jail, housing supports, mental health care, trauma-informed therapeutic supports to help guide better responses to difficult situations, stressors, and fears. What we know about this population is that they respond to what we take for granted, getting up and going to an appointment rises in them a level of fear and flight or flight response that does not actually happen for average New Yorkers and citizens. Improving the outcomes for this group is possible, and we will be coordinating across our incredible array of talented service providers to do everything in the city's power to increase the intensity, precision, and effectiveness of how we help this population successfully return to court to answer their charges, and to avoid reoffending. So what you know is more intense individualized supervision and clinical supports equals reduced rearrest rates, increased court appearance rates to go back and finish their cases and address their 
crimes and fairer, more efficient system operation for the criminal justice system. Great, excellent. So if I could just, you know, a couple of things, uh, Deanna, and first of all, thank you. That was very informative, and I, I'm, I'm relatively confident that our listeners here, you know, got a thorough education and understanding of this issue here. So small percentage of the pop population creating an inordinate amount of a crime is taking place, right? Driving the numbers, are, the percentages are higher. And even within that small amount, like we can identify even within that small amount, the ones that are actually taking that and now creating violent felony offenses against us. So we can see the population, it's 9,000. That population will change because since it's common sense criteria, then people roll in and people roll out. But the trend of 9,000 people that are overall reoffending stays and 2,000 of them will go on to commit violent felony offenses. And since we're talking about recidivism, we, we know who these individuals are, correct? In, well, we know we can identify them at arraignment, and so we know that we need to do something different for right, these individuals. Right. Exactly. And, 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 and that difference can be harsh incarcerations, but it could actually just be services that they actually need as well, right? Absolutely. So There's the two things that you can give them, right? You know, if, if it's required for incarcerations, which as a society we do want to make sure that that is only a last step, a last result. We want to be able to make the assessment, the triage to determine will housing work, will job work, will mental health uh, assistance work, uh, work to be able to get these individuals out of criminal justice systems and as a last resort incarceration, if need be, just to save the rest of society. Would I be accurate in, in, in framing it? That is very time? accurate. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so listen here, that, uh, that actually sums up our, our presentations for this week. Once again, thank you, and I believe that we're going to go to some type of questions, uh, Derek. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We will now take a few on-topic questions from the media related to today's presentations. We encourage those who have an on-topic question related to today's briefing to use the raise hand function now. For any off-topic questions, please follow up with the press office for a response. Our first question will come from Deborah Lee Santos, who is with the Manhattan Times Bronx Free Press. Deborah, Yulon, Deborah Lee Yulon is now unmuted. Terrific. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Terrific. Thank you for the time um, and the presentations. Um, in tying the conversation uh, to pu on public safety to a change in seasons and the uptick uh, of use of the park screen spaces and overall increase in just the use of public spaces. Um, you know, it's an obvious concern that the youth-related incidents that we've seen uh, proliferate uh, involving guns in instance, some instances, not involving them in others. For example, the uptown platform scene where a young man was was brutally beaten by another group of, of, of youths. Um, the concern also uh, is uh, exacerbated as we turn again in terms of the um, the season and think about how there will be more use of public spaces, there will be more congregation, there will be more um, opportunities, rightfully so. Um, and I want to ask um, the deputy mayor uh, to speak to how it is at the NYPD and the city agencies that are represented here today um, specifically plan on addressing um, uh, that concern uh, because, again, you're you're already seeing that uptick in, in youth uh, violence and youth incidents, um, and that's likely only going to be exacerbated by um, the change in, in weather. Thank you for the question, Deborah Lee. Uh, unfortunately, we only have time today to take questions related to the presentations that were made during this briefing. Uh, we will refer that question to the press office and somebody will follow up with you later this afternoon. Our next question comes from Bernadette Hogan from the New York Post. Bernadette, your line is now unmuted. Great, hi guys, thank you so much. Um, this is a question for Director Logan. The figures that you provided about the group of 9,000 and then the smaller group of very violent um, offenders, the 2,000, how do those figures compare to 2019 or 2018? What's the five-year arc, and how can you explain that transition of numbers? So, un the so unfortunately, when we look at the data, part of this unprecedented collaboration was to get us additional variables that really start in 2020 and don't allow us to go back into the 2019, 2018 to do that. We do know that our partners in criminal justice, uh, as, as so 
oh goodness, CJA is what we refer to them as, have a dashboard that kind of gives a little look into this population, but overall the data really starts and is reliable when we look starting in 2020. Thank you. Earlier this week, the administration reached out to New Yorkers, asking them to submit questions for the officials that have joined us here today. We will now get to as many of those as we can with the time that we have left. Our first question comes from Alice in Queens and is for the Parks Department. She asks, if a park is overgrown with invasive vines, such as English ivy, how can I report it to be removed? Great, thank you very much, Alice, for the question. Um, certainly control of vegetation in parks is a, one of our primary focus. And if there's overgrown vegetation, we encourage any citizen to call 311 and report it through 311 with the location. And if you have a sense of the type of vegetation, you can also submit photographs and then we'll follow up on that request. Thank you. Our next question comes from Richard from the Bronx and is for the NYPD. He asks, the most recent opportunity for the community to participate in the Bronx Comstat was a real example of transparency and fostering trust. How can the community further support the NYPD with community-oriented policing separate and apart from precinct councils? Thank you. Yes, so we, we just had our, uh, really our second uh, Comstat community meeting, which went very well uh, with, with the Bronx this week. You know, as always, uh, you know, it, it's the community and police working together, right? So the police department needs the community uh, for the eyes and ears, you know, call 311, call 911, you know, walk into your local precinct and really meet the officers uh, from that precinct or or the area that, that you live in or the area that you uh, work in. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Our next question comes from Kathleen in Brooklyn for MockJ. In response to the COVID pandemic, MockJ worked with community organizations to open emergency re-entry housing to decarcerate Rikers Island. Does MockJ remain committed to the emergency low barrier re-entry housing model in addition to the transitional housing beds scheduled to come online this summer? So the administration and MockJ are committed to making sure that housing is a priority. When we opened up the reentry emergency hotels, that was always meant to be a short-term emergency. We are now working to move into transitional housing, which is a much more cost-effective way for the city to provide housing to all of those people who have criminal justice involvement. Most importantly, what the emergency reentry hotels did for us was allow us to take best lessons learned, meaning that as we're moving into transitional housing, we will make sure that the partners that are providing it have immediate placement for individuals within the 24 to 48 hour period that we had to do with emergency hotels. We will have the on-site services that support individuals and we will be able to do it at a much more, much more cost effective way for the city and for all of the people that need the supports. Our next question comes from Lauren from Queens for the Parks Department. She asks, has the past infestation of the spotted lanternfly compromised the health of street trees? Is there a plan to survey street trees and exterminate spotted lanternflies? Thank you, Lauren, for that question. Actually, the state's Department of Agriculture is the lead agency on spotted lanternflies, and we regularly coordinate approaches and response to them. The spotted lanternfly is mainly a threat to agricultural crops. Alone, they, are, they do not kill trees, although in great quantities, they could weaken trees. Um, at this time, we at Parks are not considering any widespread treatment or certainly not removal of trees in order to control the spotted lanternfly population. We do encourage all New Yorkers, though, if you see a spotted lanternfly, please feel free to just squash it and dispose of it. Thank you. All right. The next question comes from Greg on Staten Island, and this is actually related to the chief's presentation uh, just earlier. Um, are there more local police patrols being planned to combat people walking around in early hours of the morning, checking car doors in private driveways and parked on the street? Thank you, Greg. So yes, so we have seen a, a uptick in motor vehicle break-ins uh, in Staten Island. We actually just had Staten Island into uh, Comstat just, just a couple of weeks ago, and, and that was one of the things 
that we were uh, questioning the commanders on. So what the commanders have done is they have moved some patrols to the to the areas and to the times that they do see um, a cluster of car breaks. And we're also looking at uh, car break recidivis recidivists who might live in the area, but you definitely will see and, and are seeing a, a more increased patrol in regards to car breaks in Staten Island. Next question comes from Roger from Staten Island. This is for Mock J. Does your office track repeat offenders when it comes to shoplifting? This is a big problem in our city. So, Mock J doesn't actually track individuals. We review aggregate data to identify trends and patterns that allow our partners to work and support individuals, but also for NYPD does the enforcement part of that work. Um, we do, however, uh, work with the mayor on those initiatives that are most pressing. And so as it regards to retail theft, there will be more to come because we have been working very closely with Deputy Mayor Banks and with the mayor for the retail theft plan uh, on individuals that are the recidivists that are driving that. So if I could just add to it. So the New York City Police Department does track shoplifting recidivists as we track all recidiv recidivists in New York City. And I will tell you this, we know who the 327 individuals are that have been arrested over 6,000 times in the past year. Say those numbers again. 327 people have been arrested 6,000 times for shop shoplifting related crime. And when you look at those individuals, Almost half of them are convicted felons. So those are the individuals, some of them, that Deanna Logan was speaking about during her presentation. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sarah in Brooklyn and is for the Parks Department. Can you tell me more about the plan to bring legal e-bikes into parks? Great, thank you, Sarah, for that question. We're very excited about this pilot initiative. We at Parks, along with the entire city, has seen the significant growth in electric micro-mobility, including e-bikes. And in coordination with our sister agencies across the city, we're very pleased to be part of Mayor Adams' recently announced micro-mobility plan. This includes a pilot which will allow e-bikes on Parks roads and designated greenways. These are critical part of the city's infrastructure of mobility. As with all things, safety is our top concern. So micro um, e-bikes will not be allowed on pedestrian only pathways. The goal of the pilot is again, e-bikes on park roadways and greenways. Through the pilot, we will be looking at interventions that help support safety on these paths, including signage, education to help reduce conflicts. We'll have more details about the pilot closer to its rollout in the beginning of the summer. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lorraine from Queens, which is a question that we've received repeatedly during this week's responses from the public. Uh, and it focuses around um, regulation of law and licensing for e-scooters, mopeds, and fly bikes when it comes to riding on sidewalks. This is very dangerous. And if someone is caught doing so, can it be confiscated? So yes. So uh, bicycle enforcement uh, through our patrol officers, our 20,000 approximate patrol offices, and our uh, highway offices is something that we take very seriously. And it is uh, illegal to, to ride recklessly on a sidewalk, things of that nature. So, so it is something that we enforce, and we've seen a sharp increase in that type of enforcement. Thank you, Chief. On behalf of the Adams administration, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in to today's briefing. We look forward to seeing you all at our next one. Have a great day.